Welcome everybody, I'm Tony Hughes. Uh, this is the CEO Sales Insights Show. Uh, it's, an absolutely, it's an absolute pleasure uh, to be doing the show today with uh, Warwick Kirby, who's the CEO of CAM Software. I'll introduce Warwick in a moment. Uh, we're going out live on LinkedIn Live and just really encourage you to get involved today. Uh, you can type your uh, questions into the comments field inside LinkedIn and we'll see those in here. For people that registered through the Sales IQ Global website, uh, we had a number of questions come through there as well. Uh, also really encourage you to go to the Sales IQ Global website and register for the CEO Sales Insights Show. You'll then receive an email with a recording of this episode and previous episodes. Last month, uh, we had an incredible conversation with the CEO for Asia Pacific of Adobe, Simon Tate. Uh, so that was an excellent episode. You'll gain access to that as well. Uh, I just also really want to thank our sponsors uh, for the show today. Uh, so we've got Trigger, uh, which is the sales intelligence platform uh, for helping you drive top of funnel opportunities. We've also got uh, my good friend Chris Beal from Connect and Sell. Uh, they're a parallel assisted dialing solution that enables sellers to have more conversations in a day than most salespeople would have in a month. Uh, our major sponsor for the show today is Ring DNA, and Ring DNA is a revenue operations platform that uses AI to transform sales teams into high-performance revenue engines. Uh, they're the leading choice for Salesforce customers, uh, and Ring DNA clients include uh, Hewlett Packard, Nutanix, Amazon Web Services. They offer a complete solution for sales engagement, for sales playbook execution. Uh, performance insights, conversation intelligence and coaching, and much more. Uh, they're backed by Gold, Goldman Sachs uh, and some of the best VC firms uh, in the USA. They were named one of Deloitte's uh, 2020 technology fast 500 companies. Uh, so we'd like to thank them for also being a sponsor. Uh, I'm an experienced CEO myself. Uh, I'm also the co-founder uh, of Sales IQ Global. Uh, and I know that salespeople are always wanting to elevate the conversations. Uh, we want to sell into the C-suite. And this show is really designed to do two things for you. If you're an aspiring leader, uh, a director of a company or a CEO or general manager yourself, uh, you'll gain some real insights from Warwick today in the conversation around how you can drive sustainable, predictable, top-line revenue growth in your organization and really create a customer-centric, uh, positive sales culture. And if you're a salesperson that's watching this, the second half of the conversation is going to really assist you uh, in how to gain access to the C-suite, get some insights into uh, how uh, a CEO really thinks. So I'm, I'm going to bring Warwick in in a moment, um, but Warwick is an experienced chief executive with 25 years career experience in the technology industry. Uh, he's a double master's qualified professional. He's a fellow of the Australian Institute of Company Directors, uh, and he's the author of this book here that I absolutely love, uh, Startup, It's a Blood Sport. I had the privilege of writing the foreword for this book, so I really encourage you to, to get and, and buy that book. Uh, he's the Chief Executive Officer of CAMS Group. They're a globally recognized provider of risk and performance management software, uh, and he's passionate about the latest trends in digital B2B enterprise growth. So without any further ado, I'd like to welcome welcome Warwick. So, mate, th thank you for coming onto the show. Thanks, Tony. Hey, um, I think would it be great just to, just out of the gate? Would you mind giving people a little bit of your your background uh, and also some scope about what Cams does in the marketplace? Yeah, look, I'll, I'll just start on Cams first, I guess, and and address it in reference to the problem we solve. Uh, look. A lot of companies you have strategies uh, that have goals and objectives and KPIs that they need to share within the organisation. Uh, they have initiatives within those strategies that, that, that generate projects. Uh, within their strategies, they have uh, risks that need to be uh, monitored and controlled. And those risks could be IT risks, operational risks, strategic risks. And finally, you want to make sure your people are aligned to the strategy or assigned to risks or projects. We solve that problem by one single platform. So um, 
that's really been our unique advantage in market. And it's recently been uh, named on uh, the Gartner Magic Quadrant and 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 even just uh, this month on the Forrester GRC wave, which we're delighted with. Uh, in, I guess in terms of my path, I started way back in 95 uh, and I started an IT company, a business intelligence company as a, as a consultant. Uh, I then saw uh, pre-sales, moved into pre-sales and saw all the salespeople making all the money. So um, I asked my boss if I could go there and he said, Warwick, I really like you, but if you go there and you don't succeed, I'm going to have to let you go. So um, that was like a red rag to me, Tony. So. I went, I went to sales around about 1998 and by 2000 and 2001, I thought I was pretty hot at it, mainly because there was the Y2K, which we all loved in IT and, and GST by John Howard made another compelling event for all of us to turn up and do a presentation and, and think we're pretty good. I think the, the dot-com crash really made everyone wake up uh, and for myself, uh, I had to really look at myself and go, what, what can I do better? So. What I did is uh, I really went into understanding this whole science of sales and, uh, and I studied John Patterson way back around the NCR and, and understood how uh, Tom Watson moved from there to a company called International Business Machines, which did pretty well. And, and out of that came Xerox and, and from Xerox, uh, spin selling came out of it, I think solution selling. So I, I actually wanted to understand the science of what I was doing as a role. And then um, you know, I went to IBM's uh, signature selling courses, Oracle did some great courses and it enabled me to see, to see the power of a single language. So everyone in the team understanding what, what does commit mean? What does uh, moving the ball mean in a strategy? Um, and then from there, I moved into sales management and uh, learned a lot. Wasn't the great manager when I first started as many of us are and again, had to look at my leadership and how to lead better. Uh, I worked at Oracle in leadership roles. I worked in, uh, for a number of uh, US multinationals. And then I came to a stage in my life where I thought, you know what, I, I really want to do something a little bit different. And I had a coach and the coach said, why don't you uh, work your way to be a CEO? So with that, I, I did a lot more work around the science of uh, software development. I uh, took a step back and worked at a company, uh, Blatants, and, and ran their software development practice, which was a great role. And that gave me another discipline. So then from there in 2012, um, I was able to pivot into uh, leadership roles. And I took my first CEO role at One Test uh, Rebellion in Brisbane. And from there, I've been a CEO at a number of firms, done some IPOs. And for the last three years, I've been at CAMS. And CAMS has had phenomenal growth and you operate globally. I, I just want to go back a little bit, Warwick, to the comment that you made that when you moved from individual contributor salesperson to be a sales manager, that you didn't feel you were great initially. What, what, what's your advice to people that are looking to make the transition from individual contributor into a leadership role in the world of selling? Yeah, look, I think it's, um, as my wife says, it's not all about you. Um, yeah. So... <laughs> Um, <laughs> wives wives are full of great advice yeah uh, so individual contributor obviously you're very focused about doing your one role and and and, and uh, making that work and it's more of a in some ways a more of a selfish role and and a sales management role is is moved to a more of a servant leadership role where you're saying how can I help everyone else and that's quite a pivotal move in, in how we actually you approach problems how you deal with people and it's not an easy one. So, uh, you know, a, me and my, my approach, if I don't know something, I study the hell out of it and then try and take the theory and put it back into practice. So that's why, and made lots of mistakes along the way. You, you and I have both had a similar career path into CEO roles in that it, it came through the sales line of business in an organisation. In your view, what level of advantage does that give a CEO if they if they understand selling versus the other disciplines in business around supply chain, logistics, finance, operations? Yeah, I think it gives a great advantage because so many companies I meet, you ask them what type of company are you, and they'll say, "Oh, we're a growth company," um, and and a lot of. Uh, new companies or, or a lot of companies that start off with an idea and, and a great idea, uh, you know, the founders may not always be 
the greatest uh, growth person and how to take something and commercialize it. So coming into a company in my, in, I guess my brand, I can go to a company and say, look, my focus really is on, on growth and understanding how to commercialize it. Some other companies really need a, a CFO slash CEO that, that, that blend works. Um, so it's a matter of uh, looking at your your brand. In my view, if you want to be a CEO, you can't just be, oh, I was a sales director and that's it. I think you need to understand more discipline. So what I did, I actually went off and, you know, I, I did a company director's course to make I un, make sure I understood how a, a board thinks. So I did my MBA to make sure I, I really did understand strategy and the broader aspects of operations. And then I did Prince too to understand how change management projects work. And then I did ITIL for, for service management. So I tried to uh, align theory with parts of the role so I can, again, when I'm going for roles, I can show that I've actually understood every part of the role because if you just come in as a sales director, you can be bamboozled by CTO and, and be cross-eyed in what they're saying. And you can't afford to do that from my view. It's really interesting that you made a point of understanding really what a board looks for. What, what's your advice to CEOs and other leaders that are that are listening and watching this now? What's your advice to them about managing the board and and things like a forecast? Because there's there's ways to very quickly damage your credibility with your own board, right? What, what's what's your advice to manage the board? I think two two aspects. Um, the first aspect uh, is know your numbers. Uh, you must know your numbers and provide timely and relevant information is the first thing. Second thing is cash is king. Uh, so, you, you know, and when I just say cash is king, cash flow forecasting and managing the cash flow. Uh, third, as to your point, is forecast accuracy. Uh, and you need um, to provide that confidence and, and, and then um, deliver on that is, is, you know, it all comes around to any fiscal stewardship. Uh, and I guess coming back to the role is is my role, frankly, is to execute the strategy that's been signed off by the board aligned to the budget. I think the second aspect is to know what a board does. Um, so understand the roles of the board, the duties, duty of care that they have. Um, you know, I have to work through and, and with the chairman. That's my, my role. And I think also understand how a board thinks. So, you know, boards are conscious of not just, you know, good operations, but they might be thinking about uh, a liquidity event, for example, that they might be thinking about an M&A or it could be, uh, it could be an IPO and, and you need to understand the difference between a VC and a PE and what that means in a family office and the returns for those organisations that might invest. So there's, there's more than just turning up and, and, you know, giving a report. I think you have to look at it from multiple lenses from my, my experience. One of the things I've always believed is that it's relatively easy, if if not unpleasant, but it's relatively easy to cut costs. And someone that comes from a finance background, I find, is very focused on cost control. But the thing that's really difficult is driving sustained top line revenue growth. So what, what what's your view about how the world has changed? I guess, especially in the last 18 months, we're now very much in a digital first world and securing engagement for sellers with their prospective clients and even existing customers is more difficult. But what what's your thoughts about how selling has changed and what CEOs need to think about in adapting their own business models? Yeah, look, I'll answer that with, I guess, my, my view of the industry. Uh, and, and when I started in the old days, I'll call it, um, yeah. the yellow page was my Google. Um, ACK was my Salesforce, my CRM. Uh, but if I if I look at it from how things have changed, it was interesting. I, I knew you were going to ask me this question, so I, I did think about it. Um, I look at your books. In 2010, you were actually advocating the importance of deal strategy and, and how to actually run a deal with that Joshua Principle book. And that was critical. And then, you know, 2015, 16, you came out with combo selling, basically saying to sales professionals, self-manage your ability to actually get a pipeline. So understand some of the tools coming out with that and don't just rely on um, marketing to set things up for you. And, and, and of late, you've come out with the tech-powered sales, which I think is 
is the most powerful one because it's basically saying get your head around the digital assets and the digital transformation that's happened within an enterprise B2B selling to actually understand and manage the top of funnel and, and, and be in control of that because the top of funnel and how you, how you get leads through triggers and, and, and the tools that you need to know has changed over the last four to five years. So does that give you a bit of an understanding of how I think it's changed? And, and that's how you need to start to look at it? Yeah, mate, mate, it absolutely does. And I guess that leads into maybe my next question, which is where do you see the biggest revenue generation risks? You know, is that is that really around top of funnel or is it in is it in sales execution? Is it in retaining and growing your existing customer base? What do you think the reality is today? Where, where's the big risk? I'll answer it through uh, from my experience. Um, and, and even when I go to a company, the answer is it depends. But I always start at the bottom of the funnel. If I can't get a forecast accuracy, nothing works. So I start there with the disciplines around that. And then I try and move up the funnel. So then what is the opportunity cover I need? And for our company, we need um, 3.32 times cover. We know that. We're, and when we, people say three times cover is a throwaway, it, what's that mean? Well, for us, it means in 90 days, we need to have 3.32 times of cover to actually know that we'll pretty much close the numbers that have been forecasting as another lens. If that's accurate, then you go higher and then you start to look at MQLs and you start to look at the conversion rates of MQLs to sales, sales accepted leads into opportunities. And if you start then to actually know those metrics, you can start to manage your business at the MQL level rather than at the forecast. So from my experience is how do I get up to the MQL and top of funnel? And that's why I've been interested in all the things that you've been talking about, because if I understand and have the right tools and the assets, I can actually have the knowledge and, and the power to actually know what's going on at that level. So if I know how many MQLs I've got in, in I know it's going to go through the funnel and I'm more comfortable rather than running the business on the forecast and just having that. Does that make sense? Yeah, Warwick, it really does. And and, and my business partner, the, the other co-founder for Sales IQ, Luigi Prestonenzi, is an absolute master at building, you know, those those top of funnel processes. Cause because I like what you're saying. You know, you've you you took the time to understand selling and revenue generation as a process so that you can go and drive that. And I guess for everybody that's listening into this, there's really two kind of um, sources of of top of funnel. It's it's inbound. So it's the activity that we drive that creates inbound, those MQLs, marketing qualified leads that we want to convert. And then there's outbound. Um, you know, I just noticed here that uh, uh, Charles Frasetto has just made the comment that, you know, we as a team still cold call and we prospect key target markets, um, you know, for their clients. And that's obviously an important part of it. We all need to know what our ideal customer profile looks like um, and then go and then very deliberately go after them in a way that gives us the highest probability of success. Um, I'm really interested in what you say about about forecasting because I see a lot of organizations will recognize that they need a level of pipeline coverage to de-risk the forecast. But then there's the issue of ensuring the quality of what's in that coverage and that we're managing deal deal progression. We know the deals, for example, that are stuck for too long in a stage, you know, the, the, the danger is they'll slip and just go away. What What's your approach to, to managing the quality of selling as it, as it goes through that funnel to give you the forecasting predictability? Uh, my approach is this, don't use one lens to do your forecast. So- um, Wow, that, that's great advice. Yeah, so, and, and one lens might be for me just to go, I've got three VPs globally, one in Asia Pac, one in the UK and one in North America. And, and they do the same with what I'm saying here anyway. I just don't go and say, what's your number? And say, great. And like Mr. Bean, go and go to the board and say, there's, there's, the, <laughs> there's, there's the number and go back, what's your number and go there. So we look at, um, we look at it through multiple lenses. Obviously, we do weekly um, cadence uh, forecasting. Uh, we look at forecasting by worst case commit upside. And, and also, as people come in, we actually make sure everyone understands what does commit or forecast mean? What does upside mean? We look at 
the VP forecast, we then look at the white weighted pipeline that I talked about. We then look at, um, and that's the linear uh, process. Every CRM's got a linear approach of the of the process and you do a weight, it's at 60% and it might be 100K, so it weights it at 60K and you do all your weighted pipelines and come out with a number that should also be pretty close, you'd expect to the forecast. We also do milestone for, um, uh, pipeline or forecasting. At the end of each month, we can look at milestones. So what I mean by that is this, um, every CRM system expects you to actually have a linear process. Whereas in real life, sometimes you've got the authority first, then you might have need second, budget, and then demo and the proposal. Other times you might have it in different, different orders. So what we do is we do it by milestone, like um, score it and points rather than a linear one. And we in, in give them points and then look at that forecast as opposed to the weighted forecast that's linear. We look at pipeline cover, we look at sentiment or gut feel, and we look at credibility, historical performance. We bring it together in around five lenses. And we create a spider graph and we look at each one with the wow. budget and we say, is anyone spiking in or out? If it's not, well, then we can go, you know what, we're pretty good. If it is, we go, which one's correct? And then we deep dive. Does that make sense? So that's probably um, the first thing. I, I guess the second thing that's um, really critical to me is to treat the CRM as much as a CFO would treat their accounting system. So what I mean by that is um, we we use ProBand, as you know, in our business. Uh, we use uh, we understand sales strategy, uh, competition, and next step. So in every opportunity, regardless of where it's at. I, I can look at procurement, budget, authority, need, time frame, strategy, competition. And if it's a question mark or we don't know, the next step should say, next step Find is out. I need to confirm time frame, right? And then as a CEO, I can I should be able to log into Salesforce or Pipedrive or whatever and look at it and make a comment to a BDM. And that's what I do actually. And I learned that because I heard that Mark Benioff does it, and if he can do it, so can I. So <laughs> that's that's the tr that's the trick with um, CRMs is you don't want people to be overburdened, but what don't put it in. So you got to put the least in that you can actually read and make a comment and see the logic of what they're doing. I really love that, and for everybody listening to this and watching this. Um, just remember that for the CEO, the thing that destroys their credibility with their own board, the thing that makes their head explode is if the numbers are wrong, right? So the thing I'm hearing you say, Warwick, is that you have to know your numbers extremely well every time you talk to your board. You have to deliver a predictable forecast that they have confidence in. I also love the fact that you've talked about that CRM needs to be the single source of truth about everything that's going on with sales, marketing, managing customer lifecycle. And just, you know, my, my advice for every CEO or leader that's watching this, as you implement CRM, we need to make sure that it enables process for people and that it gives them their time back in the way that it's implemented. That's, that's the only basis on which we're going to get that accurate data, you know, so, so that we're able to execute that as a strategy. Hey, hey, Warwick, we'll move on in a moment for some insights for sellers. Um, just to sort of wrap up this piece for other leaders, um, what, what are the skills and qualities that you look for in sales leaders and sales people in your organisation? Okay. With, I'll answer first with sales people, probably five things. Okay. Uh, and this is, I'm talking about our business. I, I need someone with, uh, and if we're looking for someone today for a salesperson or a BDM in a role that's right now, I need someone with enterprise sales experience. Um, look, we have a great grad program and a lot of people come through that program. Our VP in the UK is from a, a grad program. But if I need a role now, they not, must have that. They must know at least one sales methodology. I don't care what it is, but at least show you've actually dived into understanding the profession you're in. Um, they must be able to talk comfortably around forecasting, CRM, what's a lead, what's an opportunity, be able to talk about cadence and how it works. So it gives me confidence they've actually done that before. The other one that I found for us is that they must have uh, GRC, um, Governance Risk Compliance uh, content knowledge. They must be able to talk to a buyer. 
that's critical. And, and finally, showing that there's some continued commitment to education. In terms of sales leaders, I'm probably looking at a little bit different. I'm looking for trustworthiness. Uh, work hard, tell the truth is what I say, because we're in a COVID world and I'm, I'm managing a company that's got everyone around the world. And, and you just got to know that they're trustworthy, which we have. No surprises and good communicators. It's the second thing. Third is probably use disciplines. I expect them to use disciplines when we're required. Um, sometimes in a in a in a quarter you've got one or two elephants. I expect to have closed plans, call plans. So you lift up the game in our business when they're when they're the larger and important ones. Uh, I believe they must you know honour the servant leadership. Basically, what can I do to help my team to be successful and also commit to continue uh, education. A lot of what you've just described, I guess, also speaks to the culture that you seek to create in the organisation. Is there anything you want to say about how you describe the culture at CAMS, you know, that you've built? Yeah, look, um, it's, it's sometimes hard when the CEO says this is what the culture is, but um, <laughs> the, 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 look, the culture I'm trying to instil in, in our growth teams is trustworthy um, empowerment. Uh, you know, too many companies, and I've worked in some of the biggest in the world, uh, in, particularly in ERP, you know, you feel like you can't say anything. You run to the client and they, they say, well, can we have, uh, you know, some some other part of the negotiation or some maybe uh, extra licenses or different discounts and you go, oh, can I come back to you a week later? Yes, you can. Um, so I want to empower empower our, uh, our senior um, salespeople to actually um, take that role and negotiate for them, for us uh, in a responsible way um, within frameworks. But uh, back themselves is another part of our, our, we want people to be able to back themselves and it's okay to make a mistake. And finally, as I said, you've got to have a discipline. So uh, the culture is uh, scientific, uh, as I mentioned around the CRM and also uh, have a bit of fun. Awesome. And the thing we all know is that culture is nothing more, nothing less at the end of the day than the behaviour of, of leaders and people on the team, right? So so I really love that. And I've seen your organisation in action. It's a really good, healthy, customer-centric accountability culture, which is great. So, hey, Warwick, let's, let's pivot a little. Let's try and provide some insights for salespeople. So uh, salespeople all want to go and sell to the C-suite. <laughs> everybody's heart starts racing and their palms start sweating when they think they're going to pick up the phone and make that call. Um, and none of us want to botch, botch that attempt, right? We know that we get one shot at the top. So if someone wanted to secure a meeting with you, what, what's the basis on which you would typically accept the meeting? Like what, what would the reason need to be that they're, that they're giving you? Look, uh, coming back to what we talked about before is understanding the roles who you're engaging. And I guess, you know, you asked about working with the board. I, I'm saying, well, if you want to be a CEO, understand the context of the board and what's important for directors. And it's the same for a CEO. You don't talk a CEO about some transactional matter. You'd want to go to them about something that's related potentially to a board matter. Something's around for us. For me, around it's probably around strategic growth. Um, uh, partnerships, strategic partnerships is important to me now. Um, Retention for any any um, cloud SaaS company is a key key measure for a, a CEO to um, manage, and also probably professional development. But you know, uh, we're we're not your biggest firm. You know, we've got four hundred uh, employees, and uh, you know, I, I will take calls on some strategic matters, but most of the operationals, um, you know, obviously go to the right people there, and also to get a meeting, you know, to reach out is to use a little bit of the combo, have a bit of, um, you know, a strategic approach of approaching me as well. Yeah, and, and Warwick, uh, just for those listening, uh, Warwick's comments are very consistent with what Simon Tate said in the last show, that if you contact him and want to talk about something that's operational, in his mind, he's just going to delegate that off to whoever looks after that for him. So, so you're right, Warwick. If it speaks to how you can execute strategy, get strategic partners in partnerships in place, I guess anything around how you're measured by the board, if it can if it can de-risk an initiative for you or help drive something new that contributes, that that'd be the basis. Yeah, absolutely. And mate, what about the best path to get to you? So, so for example, if your phone rings 
and you look at your phone and the person's not in your phone book, will you typically still answer it? Um, is Does email work, LinkedIn? Um, what What's the advice for the best path to get to you? Uh, probably the best path, in, well, one of the best parts is referral. Uh, another path is go from the top, <laughs> from the board, I'll pick up the phone. Um, I, I think too also, um, for me, it needs to be uh, really w well researched uh, when people re reach out. So I do sometimes take calls and, and that's fine. Often my EA filters a lot of the emails that come through and we meet once a week on a one-on-one -on -one and, and we might talk about, she might say, look, there's one interesting one I thought you might be interested in. So my EA still is, is part of that as well. But, you know, if I do take the phone uh, and, and I might at times, um, you know, be be well researched. Um, know what we do. Have a you know notice something. I noticed something, Warwick, and I thought I'd you know talk to you. But you know, I wanted to do that, so use that link of at least showing you've researched. I'm a salesperson by heart, so I I respect <laughs> that. But, um, you know, I don't respect just the you know the spam type call. If someone wants just to tell you about what they do, low interest, yep. right? They they've got to show relevance. I was really intrigued that you said that if someone contacted you because they were referred by the board. So if a seller contacted someone on your board and got a bit of coaching and then called you, that that wouldn't put you off? You'd respect that? Yeah. I mean, you know, sometimes the, you know, the border, you know, they come to monthly meetings and they see, you know, what we're doing in strategies and, and you know, they might even uh, have a connection or someone might see it and go through the board and the board might go, you know what, you know, we've got a PE investment. They they might hear of something and say, Warwick, this might be of interest to you. So, you know, it, it's an avenue. It's a, you got to be careful. Uh, it's gonna be, uh, but, um, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's a way to get through. Um, you know, we're, we're not as, uh, you know, big as other companies I've worked for, so it's different. But, you know, we're, we're still agile enough and, and we're still open for um uh, you know i'm open for anyone you know if the board says it might be worth having a call i will do that absolutely wow okay look that's that that's certainly great advice we'll, we'll go to questions in a moment um mate let's maybe let's maybe have some fun and I, I i just noticed a couple of comments in the chat peter goring says he he loves the fact that selling can be fun and scientific you know all at the same time and I guess if you get the science right in selling, then the process can be fun because you've taken the stress and pressure away uh, if you've got the right level of coverage and you're running it well as a process. Um, but Warwick, give, give me some examples of maybe the best and the worst attempts you've seen of a seller trying to, to get to you as a CEO. Uh, obviously, the, the worst is easy because we've all got them. You know, it's that... You know, it, particularly that some of the networking event firms that that say, look, we've got a meeting with all these senior people, and you know, I had one recently. It's around all these HR people. It's like, well, you don't even know the persona of who we typically go to. So that unresearched, just just annoying. Uh, but I think an interesting one when I had my first role, I mentioned in, in Brisbane, and uh, I'm in Sydney. And, Said to my wife, "Hey, let's go there. Um, it'd be great." Um, and it was for two and a half years. But it was interesting. We we had just had a guy come in off the street, and my EA came in and said, "This guy's just come off the street." So this is an interesting example. It's not a great example. I don't remember him do it. But you know, he came off the street. He wanted to talk to me, and I I, I met him out of curiosity. So um, I thought that was <laughs> the, it's the it was in Brisbane, mate. So there you go. <laughs> hey, um, how, how many phone calls do you get in a month from sellers? Any? Uh, look, I, I get a number. I, I get a lot of the, um, you know, uh, agencies that do it, um, okay. a number of them. Um, but, you know, it's, it's not bombarded, but, you know, I, I obviously get, get a number. And what about emails? How many emails are you getting from sellers a day? Oh, it's massive. Uh, I think there's that's massive, Tony, and, and that that's um, very much spamware. Or as I mentioned, the EA might scan a bit, but uh, yeah. 
And then what about LinkedIn? How, how do you regard LinkedIn? Is, is that an effective channel for a seller to try and get to you or is that a bit noisy and spammy as well in your mind? Look, uh, um, it's I still think it's not as bad as other people have mentioned in, in my lens. As lo- again, as long as it's, it's um, well-researched and personalised. Um, but again, the person you're going to may or may not live there as much as someone like I have that I've come from a sales background. So I still, I still, um, you know, use it extensively. Other leaders may not. Um, it has been overused as we know, and, and, uh, there are other ways to get to people in, 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 as you know, through, um, other phone methods as well. Hey, um, Darren's asking a question here. Um, I'm, I assume Warwick handles his own LinkedIn. Uh, does he accept connection requests and will he engage in conversations? So do you do you manage your, your own LinkedIn or your EA? Yeah, no, I, I do manage mine. Um, other companies I've had my EA manage it at times, but um, I still do. I still do growth myself, right? So I, I still say to the guys that we're, all, we're in a growth company. I can't say I can't. So I do and I reach out as well. Um, so people can go that way. Um, but you know, my lens is it's it's got to be researched. It's got to make uh, be um, pointed and short, as you say often. Mate, thank you. Um, I've got a wrap up question that I'll come to, but uh, I just want to go to some of the questions that we had come through. Um, Miguel asks for companies with supply chain challenges, what's the best approach to grab their attention? Um, what 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 would be your advice, Warwick? I'm happy to weigh on this as well. With supply chain challenges, yeah. So the so the thing to me is talk about the opportunity. If you're going to sell to the CEO, talk about the opportunity to drive a better outcome in their role around supply chain. Um, yeah, yeah. The um, what what's what's your view? Uh, look. A little bit. It's a, you know, again, if, if you've researched and seen that, you know, you've researched whether it's their annual report and you've seen it's part of an initiative and you can link that and they've noticed and they've noted that they're, they're looking to uh, uh, improve efficiencies or that, you know, it, it's got to be timely and, and that's why, you you know, you have cover and that's why you do outreach to multiple organisations. I, I hope that's part of the answer. I know it's yeah probably not there's no that's the answer (laughs) you know you you need to make sure that it's relevant at the right time sometimes you know for me partnerships was not relevant at the moment it is for our business yeah miguel the thing i find there's a there's a universal mistake that most sellers make is is they talk about what they do and how it works and then they try and join the dots to how they could deliver some kind of benefit for the customer. But the reality is uh, for a CEO like Warwick, and I'm sure Warwick, you'll agree with this, um, a busy leader will tune out of the conversation very quickly if they don't understand the relevance and, and, and context for them. So the moment we talk about the fact that, you know, we provide supply chain solutions or supply chain software, the, the reality is, is Warwick, and I'm putting words in your mouth, Warwick, so jump in, but you know, Warwick doesn't lie awake at night thinking, do you know what? I need more software in the business. You know, we need we need another project to implement. Like he's not really wanting any of that, but he will want the the outcome, you know, that that he can show the board that he's delivered. So we need to lead with the person's opportunity to drive an improved outcome, not with what it is that we do. If you talk about what we do, we just get delegated away straight away. Would, would you agree with that, Warwick? Yeah, and I think, I mean, I know that you mentioned one, one of the things around some, some advice, I think, for, for sellers at times. And and there are a lot of theories that have come out. One's been, you know, the Challenger um, book that's come out and and talks about being a challenger. And, and you know, my lens is I, I, I actually disagree with it. I, I prefer to have a profile that's more of a relevant storyteller, a use case teller. So you don't need to be the smartest person in the room and the thought leader because, one, I'm not the smartest person, and all the time in every meeting. So uh, that's that's the biggest challenge. And I think you know, you know, I, I studied a lot of these things. And I think the challenger one that's been talked about has been great. Look, the people that wrote it weren't 
haven't felt the heat of the kitchen themselves. And, <laughs> and I, think, I think the the to um, you know, and when you tell your stories, I can still see you know, in your eyes the pain of some of your stories, Tony. Uh, but you know, I think now is a better time to actually be a storyteller, a use case teller that then works with with the buyer. So again, about the supply chain, I'd be saying the reason I'm calling, I noticed this was seems important. We've actually helped four others that had similar challenges and, and this is the sort of returns they've got. Is that of interest to have a conversation? I mean, that's that, that linkage between use case and experience without saying where the, where the oracle of knowledge uh, is, is, I think, the way the world's going to. You, you know, we can research ourselves. Uh, so um, I, I think respect and, and authentic engagement and, and when you do reach out, you've got to make sure that you're talking as you, you get pushed to who you sound like as everyone talks about. You, you've got to think about what you're saying when you go into a CEO and, and think it through and be succinct but be confident because if your business has done it before for others, be proud of it and use that as the hook of the experience or the credibility uh, as long as it aligns to, you know, a current need. Yeah, and Sue uh, McAvoy just made the comment that um, uh, storytelling makes it so much more real. It brings trust to the buyer uh, and shows that you know what you're talking about. And, and Sue, I really agree. What Warwick is saying is spot on. The key for all of us is that when we tell our stories, we need to make the customer, the new potential customer and other existing customers we need to make them the hero of the story, not us. And the thing I've always found is uh, people are really interested in what others are doing to improve results uh, that are also issues for them. Now, we never want to be seen to be betraying the trade secrets of an organisation to their competitors. So you would never go to Coca-Cola and tell them what you're doing for Pepsi and how they're moving the needle on performance. Um, but, for example, if you were selling into the construction industry and you had mining clients and you decided that there's a there's some commonality in those two different industries and that they're very seasonal. They can have boom and bust periods. So if you wanted to take some insights about what one of those industries is doing to trim costs, but in a way that, do, that does not inhibit their ability to take advantage of growth quickly, you know, as commodity prices come back or markets change, you'd find that a CEO or a CFO would be really interested in that. Oh, I wonder what this other industry is doing strategically and operationally to be able to downscale and upscale, you know, really easily. So yeah, I I uh, I really agree with that. Um, we've 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 got a question here from Brad Woollett, um, Warwick. Uh, do you see value in benchmarking marketing and sales performance? Uh, I think yes, I, I do see it. I mean, we when I mentioned we do forecasting um, each week. Uh, and it takes five minutes to do it. And we then uh, benchmark against themselves. So seeing their own performance, benchmark against other people's in terms of their accuracy percent. That's that's uh, a, a good one to do. Uh, you know, some some companies go into massive detail around benchmarking activity and calls and, and then you can, in my lens, you can over, over, um, over, kill it in terms of what you're measuring. I guess you want to measure what the, the behaviour you're trying to achieve or the outcome. So I, I do believe in it. Uh, and obviously, um, you know, w I mean, you know our business, Tony, we, we measure it from that forecasting, benchmarking it to even the, the budget and the, the, the targets and the quotas and, and looking at people's um, performance that way. Uh, do we do it in terms of industries? Probably less so. I mean, we... we, we Sort of run our own game uh, and and have our own targets and, and we we do covers around that as well so we've our own benchmarkings around cover like i mentioned 3.32 times cover and that's our benchmark yeah. in some yeah. ways yeah the thing the thing for me i'm a i'm a big believer in is 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 benchmarking the progression of deals through your sales process so you know how long should a deal be in a stage because when things get stuck, you know, that's often when a whole lot of risk comes along. So that's certainly a good thing to benchmark. Hey, um, Vivian Chu in Singapore um, 
makes the comment she's 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 really loving this and she says that uh storytelling and use case focus is really impactful however it's hard to find good salespeople who understand the skills of being able to tell stories well what what do you do inside cams to equip your team to be able to tell great stories well we uh, do a number of things we um work with pre-sales and marketings to generate the use case stories um, that's important for us um, so we have you know we have our own little areas of sharepoint where we have the use cases and and to be able to have that um, we, we also you know invest in in people like yourselves tony to come in and, and educate our people around having uh, genuine conversations uh, and how to have that we actually invest in um, we invested in a, another individual actually how to have meetings on Zoom and have conversations on Zoom, everything. And, and that started with myself. I had it um, and I thought it was so great with this individual um, that, uh, you know, uh, Chloe, that we uh, actually then had all, all our salespeople pretty much uh, go through a lot of that. So um, how, to, how to have a conversation in a, in a professional way um, is, is really important. I remember way back when I was young, I, I took my CEO to the Commonwealth, uh, ComBank. This is 20 years ago. It was my biggest sale ever. And and my CEO was there and I was so nervous and I, I, I was kept saying, so what happens next and who needs to sign off on it and, and why will it not happen and will it happen? And my CEO came out and he said, my God, Warwick, I thought I was at the dentist and you were drilling the person on these questions and, <laughs> and you know i said boy how you you come to i said well you know i said justin you pay me to do that you pay me to do it. but i didn't do it well but you pay me to ask the right questions so it's not straightforward i still find i'm working at it all the time of how how to have a smooth conversation and to bring in the right use case at the right time uh, i know on important meetings we do do um test and and we practice a meeting before the meeting particularly around pace so that people don't talk too fast and so no one can interrupt anyone i mean that's a big one for me in in conversations i say you need to have it at a pace that if someone else in your team can help and add to it it doesn't sound like you're tripping over each other to get a point across and then you sound too salesy so they're the things that i've found it's not easy is the first answer and something we all should be working at, I, I think, as professionals. Yeah, I really think that's great advice, Warwick, for everybody. Hey, Julian Fenwick has got a question that I'd like to respond to and then throw to you, Warwick, if that's okay. J Julian says, um, you mentioned sales getting stuck at a certain point uh, and the risk that that entails. How do you suggest we unstick those deals? So, Julian, I just encourage you to think about the fact that, in my mind, there's four reasons that deals get stuck, slip, and often just die. Uh, and the first reason is a lack of compelling commercial value in the mind of the leadership team in the organisation. Because someone like Warwick will have, you know, maybe 27 different things he's being asked to approve, and he has to prioritise. So, you know, is there compelling commercial value in change otherwise people might go well yes there's roi yes it would be good but hey we've got a bit of change fatigue we don't have the bandwidth for everything you know let's just defer this one off so compelling commercial value is the first reason the second one is a lack of consensus you know warwick as a ceo would be looking for his leadership team to be on board with any change you know if you, you don't have everybody lined up and behind it, the danger is the, the initiative, even if it's unintentional, will just get sabotaged. You know, they it won't be successful. So you've got to have consensus. The third uh, thing is really understanding the buyer's evaluation, selection, contracting, procurement, approval process. If we don't understand that, it can definitely get stuck, you know, if something pops up. And the fourth thing is something nasty just happens. Our key supporter leaves, they get acquired, they post bad results. And we can't really control the third thing but if there's a sense of urgency, we reduce that risk. So my advice is the way you make sure things don't get stuck is that the customer has their own sense of urgency. It's got to be within their organization, not externally pushed from us. 
a lot of software companies make the mistake of putting external incentives like a discount or something, you know, to try and create urgency. What we want is a strong business case. And and Warwick, my my question for you is that um, uh, someone also also asked in here. Um, Matt uh, asked uh, Warwick's thoughts on the emotional economy, and it speaks to this. You know, the decisions we make are based on emotion, not rational. Is the comment he's making? So when you think about that compelling reason to do something for the organisation, so the emotion of it and the rationality of it, what 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 are your thoughts there? I couldn't agree more. I mean, um, getting back to that Challenger um, book, it talked about the Challenger understand debates then pushes. I mean, holy cow. I win the debate, now I'm going to ask for something. You know, I'm smarter than you. So, you know, and um, I I quickly read it last night because I thought, look, I just wanted to go through a couple of the methodologies that I've looked at. How... That shows that whoever's writing it hasn't done it before. You'd actually want to be more empathetic. You want to say, you know, um, tell me why you're thinking that way. Hey, you know what? Some of these other companies that we did, we, we thought about it that way as well. And I, I can see their view and I can see yours. What worked for them was this way. What, what do you think? Rather than saying you're wrong, it's this API, it's this thing, and, and I've, I've won when the argument and in life you never win something with someone and then think you you can push for something else because the world's moving i think to more uh, authentic selling um uh, you need to get that respect and and you need to have an or you know authentic relationship with the buyer and as bosworth said right at the end it's risk and yeah. trust right so um absolutely it's it's the the right side of the brain as much as the the left. Yeah, mate, I, I really love that. Paul Paul Took's got a question maybe along these lines. Um, how would Warwick measure the cost of change? I, I guess when you're evaluating how you prioritise internally, how, how do you measure the cost of change? The pain of change and the cost of change <clears throat> as a buyer. Yeah, and actually, you're right, mate. It is really pain and risk, isn't it? That's that's the big thing that we have a look at. We we tend to identify what the reward will be, but yeah, how, how much pain, how much risk, how much potential unintended consequence from change that we hadn't considered. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, you have to have that in mind. I mean, we, we're doing a lot more work around digitalizing contracts um, and using some smart approvals and things like that. That's that's going to be painful for a number of the salespeople, but for for me, I know that the governance around it, but far outweighs a bit of the pain around. Oh, I've got to use this new system to to do a contract. So, um, and also um, we're looking at the investment into Salesforce and how to integrate it, and so cost and and pain and governance, you know, all those p- factors um, come together in terms of whether it's worthy to do that change and that change at times is is painful. Yeah, no, that's great. Hey, I just want to move to a couple of questions that uh, people um, uh, put in when they registered for this through the Sales IQ website. Um, Michael Alexander and Jean Turner both have, in essence, similar questions in that they find uh, that their sales starts lower down in the organisation with areas like, like legal and they're asking about relevance with the CEO. Um, uh, and my advice on this, and then I'd love Warwick to weigh on and weigh on weigh in on this as well, is that we really ideally want to start high and then get sponsored to the people that need to be on board for consensus. Um, and the problem is, uh, in both of your questions, you talked a lot. They were actually long questions. So I can't read them out. They're very long but you talked a lot about what it is your solutions do and then you got to the benefits. And that's exactly the same problem when you go talk to a CEO. If you talk about what it is you do, you just get delegated down to procurement and legal and HR, for example, if that's if that's where your solutions uh, or products actually impact. We have to lead with how the CEO or the CFO, how they can drive improved results in their role. And once they go, yes, I want that improved result, we, we, we go, great, you know, uh, can you sponsor me to go meet with these people in the organization? 
so that I can go and validate what the business case looks like for you as CEO and then come back. So we 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 want to get delegated. So we do not want to get delegated. We want to get sponsored, and we want to do it in a way where there's a reason to go back to the CEO. And in essence, we're trying to help them nail the business case, the commercial value of change, and how they can manage all of the risks, and secure consensus within their team. If we start lower, the problem is you might be relevant for the people that lower, but then they become a blocker, and they say, "Don't don't don't ring Warwick. You know, I'll go ahead and get this approved." But then we've lost control. Would you agree with that, Warwick? What What, what are your comments? Uh, yeah, my well, first one is, um, you know, with all the work that everyone does, you don't always need to get the get the CEO. In my my view, you want the B and the A. You want someone who's got the budget or the access to funds, and you want the authority. Yes. So that might be the CFO. It might be um, someone else. I, and I'll give you an example. I used to sell in the HR space, um, psychometric assessments, and our sponsored buyer was the HR director, but who's got the budget, right? Yeah. And the who's CFO. got the authority, right? <laughs> CFO. So we started targeting the CFO and, and you know, I'll give you another example. In our business, we've targeted the chief risk and office CFO and things. So when we look at ProBand, uh, it's not budget, it's not the issue for us typically, not the authority, not the need because you actually – got that conversation, it's time frame and procurement. They, they're the big ones that that trap us on missing our numbers by time frame, right, or, or the procurement. But for other companies, um, and the other one I was talking about and around talent management, the challenge in our pro band was find the budget and find the person with the authority. They're the ones that created the real deal but the need was with with HR and, and the time frame was HR in many ways. So it's interesting when you look at your business, what are the ones that trip you over in your, you know, I call ProBan, but it could be the why, what, when, who, or how, it could be yeah. the medic, or it could be whatever, you know, um, measures you look at to say, is this a real deal? And, and what are the ones that we really need to be careful of so we don't miss our number? Thank you so much. Hey, Warwick, I'm going to wrap us up with a last question. If if you could go back in time so you could talk to the 25-year-old you, what, what advice would you give yourself? Well, I want to answer in a different way. I would do better what advice my father told me, which was enjoy your 20s because they go really fast. <laughs> How's that? Mate, mate, that's really good advice. Thank you so much. Thanks for being on the show. I just want to encourage everybody, go and buy Startup. It's a blood sport. It's a truly brilliant book. Uh, anyone in a startup, scale up, or trying to drive growth, amazing wisdom in the book. I uh, just want to thank our sponsors again, Trigger, Connect, and Sell, and then especially Ring DNA. Really encourage you to go to the Sales IQ Global website. So that's salesiqglobal.com amazing levels of content, uh, connect with Warwick uh, and myself in LinkedIn. So thanks, everybody. Uh, I'll see you on the next CEO Sales Insights show. Uh, and thanks, Warwick, so much for being part of this. Thanks, Warwick. Thanks, everybody. You're welcome. You're welcome.